He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? We might connect it to the verse before. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? It's quite a sentence really, isn't it? The way it's put, each word presses on to the one before. Well, we have here great assurance based entirely in our confidence in God not in ourselves all in God not in ourselves he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things because Jesus Christ has already been offered as the sacrifice things? for sins. Sorry? Um, what do you mean by all things? Everything all things, yes. Yeah. Everything, everything. All things ultimately is all things to be brought, to be have a resurrection of the body and to be brought, as in verse 23 says, that we're groaning at the present time, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. The Lord Jesus Christ has a glorified body in heaven and the promise here is that the people of God will also be uh, with him freely given all things. All things will be brought together at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the people of God raised whether uh, they've come, some of them are, they come with the Lord and their bodies are taken up from the grave and if they, even if they've been cremated which we prefer the Christian form of burial but if even if they're cremated or they drowned and they've never been found or they've been eaten by a crocodile they will still be resurrected with the whole body and they will appear in the presence of God and the unjust those who are outside of Christ will also be raised but they will be raised to a uh, everlasting condemnation which is no funny matter so this is the promise and it's based on the fact that he spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all therefore you can say well how shall he not or rather we might say well therefore he definitely will uh, saying the sentence how it's phrased a um, to to say how shall you not is to say that you will um, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things or we might say surely or definitely or absolutely if he's done this if Jesus Christ has come the son of God into the world to die for sinners then well if he do that then he will complete his work and he will deliver his people to himself this great chapter based on the doctrine of justification by faith therefore the people of God are brought by the Spirit of God into relationship with God uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore there is this assurance of eternal life I want to put it to you this evening that this is not based on any boasting of ourselves or in ourselves but it's entirely our confidence in God and I've divided it into four um, aspects the assurance is based on the past I don't really like to use the word performance but I couldn't think the, the, the past work the sure work that has been done already of God 
in the greatest act of the death of Christ. The assurance is based on the love of God towards his people. It's, the assurance is also based on God's intended plan. We use the word covenant or his particular redemption, his particular redemption, the definite atonement and plan and purposes of God for the full redemption of his people. His, I call it his intended plan. And it's, it, this assurance is based on our confidence in the power of God, that God has the power to do these things. So four headings. And um, just before we go to them, to say that this is for Christians only. This only applies for Christians. That's he spared not his own son, yes, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He's writing to believers, those for whom... Christ has died, those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the promise, as we come to faith in him, that he will give us all things. But it is also for backsliding Christians, for weak Christians, those who are weary, those who feel that they're not doing their bit, because as I've said, our confidence is not in ourselves, but it's in God. So uh, there is uh, there is a Fountain filled with blood, as the expression, the hymn goes, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. There is a forgiveness in Christ. There's continual acceptance of the people of God. We think, I'm not worthy to be called a Christian. But we continue trusting in Jesus Christ like the first day that we believed. It's just the same. And you may think, <coughs> I wish I was making more progress. But our confidence is not in our progress. Our confidence is is in God. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. So this assurance is a great doctrine for when you're not feeling that you're doing very well. It's to encourage you. And it's for Christians who suffer in this chapter. There's much suffering, much pain in the Christian life. But, in the verse, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Isn't that enough to cheer you up? And if you can get the, yeah, this, real Christians. this, no, exactly, for real Christians, even yeah. poor ones, but real ones. It is for Christians who know they're not 100% what they should be. It's for Christians who are described by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 12, where he quotes from Isaiah uh, 42. Uh, I mean, we just turn to the, the Isaiah reference. Isaiah 42 and verse 3 that says, A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. Jesus Christ is compassionate to the wheat, the one that's like a bruised reed, no good for, uh, for making a candle out of it, it's broken, the flax that should be giving a light is giving out smoke but no light, and yet the world would say, get rid of it, let's have a fresh one. But Jesus Christ won't break them or quench them. He revives them, he gives them a new lease of life. So this applies Christians in all sorts of conditions. It replies to Christians who are doing very well. Some Christians are doing very well and their danger, their danger is that they put their confidence in themselves and they forget that everything they have and every good promise is of the Lord. But pride becomes before a fall. But they to remember too that it was he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, who shall freely give us all things. All things are given to us because of God being good, not because we're good. This is amazing teaching from the scripture here. Now, in the context, this 
uh, sorry, in, by contrast, we, we're going to contrast then in these aspects between confidence in ourselves and confidence in God. It's so tempting to try and think we must be confident in ourselves. They say, oh children, the trouble is they need more self-esteem. Well, we say no, they need faith in God. They need faith in Jesus Christ, not to be overly confident about themselves. That would only bring about pride and foolishness. Of course, they shouldn't be feeling <coughs> pathetic. But in fact, yes, it's the pathetic. It's the weak who come and trust in Jesus Christ and are made strong. As we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and what happens to a strong person when, the, when they're made weak? Well, we see here, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. The sentence of death in ourselves. The apostles, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 9, um, they were in great troubles, great dangers of being killed. They were, we read about when Paul this morning, when he, he was in the sea for a night and a day, he got beaten with rods, got beaten with a um, lacerating whip by the uh, Jews that was that could have, or the Romans that could have killed him. Thirty-nine stripes of that, and but he said we had the sentence of death in ourselves. But you know what? He saw God's purposes in it. He said that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. That was, there's some power in that, isn't there? When you're suffering, when you've got no confidence in yourself, when you can do nothing, you've got confidence that God raises the dead, raise us from our graves one day, like he wrote, he rose Jesus Christ. There will be uh, this confidence then that God can do it that's our assurance and as Proverbs 3 verse 5 says trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding the mind even the, uh, the, uh, without this stage of relying mentally there will be no assurance spiritually we have to rely with our whole <coughs> understanding with all our heart and mind and strength relying on the Lord's teachings and understanding. So we must come to that point. And only then, as Christians, with a full trust in the death, and resurrection, and the coming again, and the judgment in Jesus Christ, our Saviour, do these words apply to us. Then we can build, be built up with this assurance based on these four aspects that I've drawn uh, largely from this text. So first, the assurance is based on the past performance of God. Reliable. If you know someone, you've trusted them before, and you know they do what they say, then this is a great basis for trusting someone for the future. If someone's very unreliable, say they do this, don't do it. You think, well, either maybe they will, maybe they won't. You just can't rely on them. But someone who's been faithful before is often proved faithful again. It's a good test. It's a surprise sometimes. You say, well, someone didn't. Someone let me down, but I was surprised. They've always been so reliable before. But we won't say that about God. Because God, what he has done before, is absolutely faithful and reliable. And that was in that he spared not his own son. There aren't many people that would do that. But delivered him up for us all. If he did that, then how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The uh, death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the giving of him by the Father, is beyond our imagination to describe. In fact, when we when we come to to some extent appreciate that the Son of God came into the world from glory to a state of humiliation, from everlasting glory with the Father, 
into a world where rather than being treated as God, he's despised, rejected of man, mocked, beaten, spat upon and crucified. And yet the he came of his own will and yet of the Father's will as well. Some people like to mock the crucifixion. They say, well, how could a father do something so cruel to his own son? But in fact, the truth of the matter is that Christ came willingly. He willingly came and laid down his life and took it up again. He willingly came. He knowingly came to bear the wrath of God, his Father, though he himself be God, but he bore the wrath of God uh, for sin, for save all his all. people, and to save all who trust in him. Now you may say, well, this idea of someone sacrificing themselves is a very strange idea. But in fact, throughout the Old Testament, it was the complete, we've been reading through this at home, if you read through the first books of the Bible, and then you could go on further into the temple, it's in Kings and Chronicles, you'll see the feature is lots and lots of sacrifices being made for sin. It started um, just outside the Garden of Eden with, um, in fact there was one sacrifice that would have been made where God himself gave, made a sacrifice for animal skins to cover the skin, to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve when they weren't originally ashamed of their sin, but when they sinned by disobeying God, then he covered them. They became ashamed of their nakedness. Uh, it's such a subject makes you blush almost, but it, it is amazing, isn't it? That there they were. There was no, now it's, it's shameful. It is to us, but to be covered now is, is the, the right thing, to wear, to wear clothes. And um, then their sons, um, Cain and Abel, they had to bring a sacrifice, and one was acceptable. It was the blood sacrifice that was acceptable to God uh, for sin. And then throughout this continual sacrifices, a daily continual burnt offering and other sacrifices of animals were made. But they knew full well that there was, they would not take away sin. Only the blood of Jesus Christ takes away sin. It is a, it is, you could, some people stumble at this and uh, you can, you can say, well I could understand you stumbling at the point that of Jesus Christ not just being a great man, but of being a sacrifice. Interestingly, he's also the priest that offers the sacrifice in the Bible. He's described as the great high priest. So, uh, and people like to criticise this, but the fact of the matter is that the disciples saw Jesus Christ after he'd been crucified, after he'd been buried, he was alive and they saw him and that gave them an absolute assurance because they'd seen him alive from the dead and they knew that the reason he died was precisely why to give his life as a ransom for many as a sacrifice and offering as a redemption as a propitiation we're coming to some of these words in just a moment let me turn you to a few references on this amazing work of Jesus Christ that has happened, that he's done for his people. You see, can you, you're thinking of heaven. We talked about the end, his how should he not give us all things. But this is what it's based on. It's based on the work, we call it the finished work of Christ. When he cried on the cross, it is finished. He didn't just mean I'm finished, that's the end of it. Uh, he meant that he finished his work. He'd done the work of offering himself and bearing all that sin on the cross. You think of the cross of Christ. You think, what a horrible scene. People deserting him. It going dark, the temple curtains being ripped. But the greatest thing was that he was bearing sin, bearing sin in his body. He was bearing the wrath of God at sin. There you could say, now, if you become a Christian, you could say, well, that was my sin. That's why I'm free. You see, and the, you see, it fits 
as I've been reading about Martin Luther, and he says, when you try and understand the Bible, yes, it is only the, it, it is the Word of God fully as it is and sufficient, but it fits our experience. There's nothing else that can set a person free from sin but the death, the blood, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that death being a substitutionary sacrifice, an atonement, a, a reconciliation, a propitiate, propitiating, bearing the wrath that should be against me. It's gone. It's done. That one full sufficient sacrifice. It, uh, I, I'll just read you some verses then. Chapter 3 of Romans, verse 25 and verse 26. Um, we could read, I'll read from verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption, the, the, the buying you back that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Our sin separates us from God but the death of Christ pays the penalty for our sins. And you know, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can say, that has done it. Nothing else could do that one thing that I needed. I couldn't do it. I couldn't pick myself up by my own bootstraps. And I certainly couldn't get myself into heaven. My sin would keep me out. But, and God is righteous and holy. And he doesn't just say, oh, forget it all. No, there's a, a serious righteousness and that that righteousness is God's being righteous in his being a judge but also it's then the righteousness of Jesus Christ taking the place of our sin as substitution and there you stand and then you can have a true appreciation and a thankfulness for Jesus Christ these things are, uh, you, you can't prepare to preach on these things. It's when you get to it, you, the, you, can, you have the expression. It's wonderful. He was, verse, chapter uh, 4 and verse 25, uh, I'm talking about the righteousness being imputed. Um, and, and it wasn't just for Abraham, but and in the last, uh, um, verse <clears throat> it's, a, it's all about faith being imputed for righteousness you've got no faith you've got faith and there is righteousness will be imputed to you the righteousness actually of Jesus Christ himself and then it is in verse 25 that he he was delivered for our offences delivered handed over and was raised again for our justification. And in chapter 5, verse 6 to 10, we read, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Without strength, ungodly? Yeah, no way there's anyone fit for glory there. But, but that's when, in due time, Christ died for them. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, peradventure, perhaps, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Died for us. I, there I am, I'm about to die. I should be about to die for my sin. And in steps Christ and died for me for us much more then being now justified by his blood 
we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Some, th some people think, well, I've been saved by the blood of Christ, and now I've got to do the rest. But here the promise is, is much more. Being reconciled by his blood, now we'll be saved by his life. It's imputed to us, it's counted to us in him. As First Peter chapter 2. Um, I, don't be, uh, I think I might just briefly, as on, the, on, the, on the way there, quote Second Corinthians chapter 5 and the end of that chapter it says he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that's he, knew, he who knew no sin to be made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him there you have the great substitution our sin well he's been made for sin for us and that we might be made the righteousness of God in him <clears throat> the substitution of sin from the believer to Christ the righteousness from Christ to the believer not of works it's all of, through faith in this work of Jesus Christ and first Peter chapter 2 and verse 24 where it says who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree uh, you say where are your sins what are you going to do with your sins well if you have faith in Christ you can say he bear our sins he bare my sins, horrible sins, in his own body on the tree. He was bearing them, carrying them there and suffering the punishment for him. That we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. Now there you see this great work of the Lord Jesus Christ he had a whole life didn't he because he went around doing miracles for some years and giving great speeches and sermons and talking to people being kind to people eating with people eating with criminals and preaching and teaching but this was his great work that no one else be able to do anything at all comparable to him he gave his life a ransom for many this is the great thing the past performance as it were on which we base our confidence we have confidence in God and, a, and an assurance therefore that he who spared not his own son but delivered us delivered him up for us all shall with him also freely give us all things or how shall he not is the question put as a question put as a statement it says he shall with him also freely give us all things based on what he's already done he's done the greatest thing to save someone from their sins to justify to count someone righteous then it's done, it's, it's in Christ, it's been done on the cross it's the finished work of Christ and so therefore for him to then take us from there to glory is a very simple work he's only got to uh, <laughs> put a bullet through our head and we'll be in heaven hopefully we'll go in a more uh, pleasant way if there is a pleasant way to die just in our sleep one day we're here, next day we wake up and he's delivered us and given us all things that's what's the next thing in store the people of God for whom Christ died 
There is, it says at the beginning of uh, chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We've got, the Spirit has come, convinced us of our sin, enabled us to trust in Jesus Christ, and therefore we're walking by the Spirit, whether we're, as, as we know we're not as, as what we should be, but, but this, is, this has happened and started. We're not walking by the flesh, we're not... Uh, we, we, we live for God and uh, there, there's no more condemnation because Jesus Christ has done it all so there's nothing now separating the believer from God your daily sin may make you feel uh, not as close to God as you should be but the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin and so therefore we, we love the Lord and he has promised to come again for his people and therefore this sure promise is based on this past act of God on the cross of Jesus Christ he's done the greatest thing therefore we can be sure that he'll do everything else that he's promised if, if, if someone had done a small thing uh, they, they uh, borrowed a pound and gave it to you back the next day and then they came the next day and say well lend me a thousand pounds you might be suspicious but if they'd given you if you lent them the thousand pounds and they gave it back to you the next day and the next day they said well come and lend me a hundred pounds you say well that's pretty fair I think I can trust him a second time but it's like that with Christ he's done the greatest thing on bearing our sins to take us to heaven is really almost nothing in comparison to what he's done already now I think we've gone on I'm sure we've gone on haven't we I'm not sure where we are at but I think we can be briefer with these other points then because we've given that so much emphasis the assurance of his love well I think you've seen this is the love of God isn't it we saw it there in um, the, the verse in, in chapter 5 and uh, um, verse 8 but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us this is an act of love I know human love can be a bit unreliable it's there it waxes and wanes but this is God's love and his love toward us is that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us this this uh, love well you know love is very powerful isn't it but what if the love comes from God he's not going to half love someone and half be um, interested in someone else he's going to really love it well God can love all his people of course without loving one of them less than another is wonderful it is a good love God is love and so in John, uh, John 3 we know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life this is the love of God in the giving of Jesus Christ it isn't just some historical theological a thing that you can think about it's a real love of God that's acting and then in, in, in 1 John 4 and verse 10 that we were I was partly quoting here in his love not that we love God important that, that that may be but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins uh, this word used most often for love it's not a brotherly love this is a love that goes and does something it's a love that reaches out that has a it has the other person's interest at heart it's not a love affair it's it's a love that that is a giving love that has the other person's interest at heart and our love to God that it, we, we respond with a similar type of love not just a sentimental love not, a, not just a mere brotherly love or a romantic love but a love that is a real caring so this is what he's done he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins it, it, it was an effective love 
it, 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 it wasn't half-hearted. It wasn't a vague um, sentimentality. It was the true work of God to save his people. Therefore, because it's the love of God that's in the cross of Christ, to his people, we have an assurance that he will also with him freely, freely give us all things. This is the way that his love is to his people. It's a fantastic text. You can only, as I say, you can only prepare yourself to preach on these things. But when you come to them, as I say, we get taken up by them. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2. Walk in love. That's a commandment. Go about your life with love. As Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself. Now it's Christ giving himself here. It's not um, the Father giving the Son, but this is all connected. Both are at work, the three persons of the Trinity are all at work. Uh, as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice. We'll be using that word sacrifice and offering to God for a sweet smelling savour. We are to return as Christ loved us and given himself. Again, we can base our assurance and our confidence not in ourselves but in the love of Christ toward us. That's why he died for those his people who come to faith in him and um, uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 uh, it says I'm crucified with Christ so the, 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 the believer as he's put his trust in Jesus Christ he's so we joined him in the crucifixion he's his, him, his, his old self is, is in a way it's finished with and his faith is in Jesus Christ and as, as he trusts in Jesus Christ he, he, he has a, re, a repentance of sin and it's as, as though he's crucified as well there's nothing left of me as, as you, you could say all my hope is in Jesus Christ nevertheless I live after all that I'm alive how? yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God doesn't change. One well, of well, the things about God, he can't lie and he can't change. Various texts in the Bible. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever. If he loved me, when he died for me, then he still loves me. And therefore I have an assurance that he will deliver me unto his heavenly kingdom. That's the thing. If you know that Jesus died for you, you can say that he loves you. You can't otherwise. You can talk in general about the love of God but it's got no power, it's got no meaning. It's just vague. It doesn't help anybody. Then thirdly, and we're getting briefer on these last ones, the assurance is based on God's plan, his covenant. It's a, it's a definite atonement. So it's, it's based on his work, his death, his love, and now his plan, his covenant, his design if you like of the work there's a definite design it's not uh, oh I think something vague it's definite John chapter 10 will serve our purposes on seeing this doctrine John chapter 10 and verse 11 I am the good shepherd the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep the sheep there they are the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep and on to verse 28 and 29. You could read this whole wonderful chapter. It's a very, very great chapter. John chapter 10. And you can remember an easy number like 10. John chapter 10, verse 27 
Now, one good thing to do, by the way, if you can't read, mm -hmm. if you can't read, for example, or it's very difficult to read, you can ask someone to read for you. Son comes, friend comes to visit, someone's got a few minutes, could you just read me John chapter 10, please? That's easy, isn't it? Just try it sometime and see what happens. Sometimes, people doing that has had a great effect. Oh, I never realised the Bible was like that, they might say. And you can, you can talk about it to them a little bit and point them to the verse. Say, look at 28. It says, or 27, My sheep hear my voice. That's us. We hear. We can't see him, but we heard. Yes, we've heard God. We've heard Jesus Christ. Draw us. And I know them, and they follow me, the sheep. And I give unto them eternal life. See the purpose in the death of Christ? He's giving unto them eternal life. This is what? Believing, having eternal life. It just goes from one to the other. It's, it's a thing. He gave his only begotten son, that they shouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. This is the purpose. This is God's purpose. He's laid down his life, Jesus has laid down his life for the sheep and he gives them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand no one can take you away they might try, they might beat you up they might like they did with the Apostle Paul they might be terribly cruel to you but you're safe with a good shepherd it says that there's none can take them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Remember those two verses from a long time ago, and be very assured of God's goodness, God's love towards me, God's certainty. It was something that He had done. He had delivered. Christ had died for me. Christ had loved me and died and given himself to save me from all my sins. I trust that that is your com not confident in ourselves. No good thing in ourselves. Nothing to boast of about ourselves. But we have it all from God. All from Jesus Christ. This is his plan. I give them eternal life. And then finally as if it doesn't already, it's already assumed. There's power. That we have an assurance because there's a work of Christ, a love of Christ, a plan of Christ, but also power. He's able to do. He's able to do it. Someone could say, well, I've done this and done that. Well, yeah, but you, what have you got? What, what are you boasting about? You've got no power. There's power. If uh, I remember... Uh, I might have told you this before. There's a hymn. There's power in the blood, it's called. Wonder-working power in the, in the precious blood of the Lamb. And we, I was singing this once in a, um, at, a, at a meeting in a tent. And there was this one man, he was jumping up and down like a... I don't even know, like he was jumping up and down. And... Uh, he was really jumping up down a lot. Power, power, wonder, working power. There is power in the lamb, in the blood, in the blood, in the uh, like this. And it is a, it's a very encouraging thing to sing loudly, very loudly. And it is real power in the blood of Jesus. And I said to him afterwards, I said, I didn't jump up and down as much as you did. I said, but in my heart, I was jumping up and down on the top of the tent because it was just so good. It was so good to be thankful that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. There is power in this. It's not without power and strength. And when you uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not the word of man, but the word of God, as Paul writes to the Thessalonians, it comes with power and much assurance. I, we should uh, look up that text before the others perhaps here. In um, at the beginning of the... Thessalonian, Thessalonian epistle, the first epistle. Um, our gospel came not in 
unto you in word only, verse 5, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. The Gospel, yes, it does come with words, in words, but the there is, you said there's more to it than the words. There's the power, there's the Holy Ghost, and there's much assurance. When you really believe the gospel, it isn't just that you've been caught up in some cult, but it does come with the power and the Holy Ghost of God, the, the third person of the Trinity. God, the Holy Spirit, is at work. And that's why it's so amazing that it's not just Christianity an intellectual belief about certain things about God, but it's God himself who's coming and working this faith in you and giving it to you and giving you repentance to hate all the sin that's behind you and to love God's ways and to seek to live for him. And there is much power. Now, of course, we need to daily be confessing our sin and walking humbly before God and being aware when we're slipping, when we're drifting, and returning with repentance. And be, but of course, this, it all builds into this fact that all these things are sure. We're assured because our confidence is not in ourselves, but our confidence is in... I'll count that as our text on power. I do have a couple of other ones in uh, John. That Jesus had power to lay his life down, to take it up again, uh, if, if God be for us, who can be against us? Which was, which was just the, the verse before the one which we're reading. And uh, that God, if he's for us, who can be against us? That's another assurance of God's power. It's God on our side. Therefore, who can be against us? He's given his, he's spared on his own son, but delivered him up from us all. How? Shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And then Jesus reminds the disciples as he before the just before the ascension, the end of Matthew twenty eight, says, All power is given unto me. The power is given to Jesus Christ, who in uh, Philippians chapter two it says um of him in verse 9 to 11 um, it says wherefore God also hath highly exalted him Jesus Christ and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This name above every name, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, He is the one who gave Himself for His people to save them. He has the power he has the love. He has he has the assurance that he's done the greatest thing and he's done all things well. He's faithful to the uttermost. He didn't shy away from the cross when he was breaking out in sweat in the Garden of Gethsemane that the Father would take this from him. He said, not my will, but thy will be done. Not as it were the human will of Christ as if there was a separate desire in him, a temptation to, uh, to, to go away from the cross but there was a full offering of himself the full will of the Father without any opposition to give himself and so with power and uh, with this assurance that it is his love and his plan and the perfect work of Jesus Christ, we can say, watch to these things. God before us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up 
for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? We can remember that. Remember some of it as much as you can. Your assurance will be increased not to make you slovenly in your Christian life, to make you immensely thankful to our amazing God and our amazing Saviour, His amazing grace, and that we will walk with a sense of awe. There's a love and a fear of God. And as we're amazed at His grace toward us, so we desire, if we're His, and we believe on it, if we're Christians, true Christians, we desire to respond by saying, well, what's life all about then now? It is to serve the Lord with gladness, to love the Lord with all our hearts, minds. This is, you think, well, ah, this is going to enable me a little better to keep, I was meant to love God, now I can love God, because he first loved me and gave himself, gave the Lord Jesus Christ propitiation clear away all that wrath all that sin and to set me straight with God and I don't deserve a moment of it I don't deserve any of it it's all God's grace freely he that spared not his own son but that delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely Give us all things. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank thee, Lord, for this wondrous, wondrous verse of, the, of thy scripture, thy word. We thank thee that the Apostle Paul was constrained from visiting the city of Rome that he wrote. And as when he wrote, he was taken up, Lord, in to heavenly places and considered uh, quietly these great truths of thy wonder, wondrous ways toward thy people. And Lord, we pray, we pray for forgiveness that we've not uh, lived as we should have done, that we've not uh, given thee the glory that we should have done. And we pray, Lord, that we may truly know what it is to have a Father in heaven whose kingdom is and his will shall be done and come and that we may be freely given all things this great promises of everlasting life and we pray Lord that would help us to endure all conditions that would uh, tend to tempt us away from this sure confidence and assurance in thy good plan and purpose for thy people Lord, help us to trust in thy love and thy power and thy plan and above all in the death of Christ which took away our sins while he bore them in his body on the tree to be a sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him by this righteousness being imputed to us through faith by thy grace that the promise may be sure oh lord we praise thee and we pray for thy help in the coming days that we may honor thee that we may proclaim that any good thing in us has come from thee and thou hast been merciful to us oh lord bless thy people here and throughout the world in the name of our lord jesus christ amen